Hi there, so I just uh, wanted to show a video of me painting this uh, it's a Grisai underpainting as usual and I painted this using raw umber and titanium white which is something I wanted to return to because I just think it's a little bit warmer than um, just using ivory black and white but uh, we'll see, you know, they both have their merits both methods have their merits uh, but I did want to, uh, just looking at some of my older paintings, I just thought I'd like to try it again. So, as usual, again, I've also um, just added some medium to the surface, just brushing it on with a sable brush. And I'm going to just rub it down. This is something that you just I've just got the hang of with practice. Uh, you just get a feel for how um, slippery you want the surface to be. This is, uh, just has to be, it's an ever so slightly... Um, covered with a little bit of medium and I'm using the acryl uh, the alkyd medium that I normally use uh, M. Graham it's his alkyd medium and I love using that just because it uh, dries very quickly so it should be touch dry especially using raw umber and white you know within 24 hours but it's certainly enough for me to be able to work on again as long as I'm gentle when I uh, put on the next layer of medium So with this painting I deliberately returned to a more painterly approach and uh, finished this grisaille quite rapidly. I'm just showing a detail now because the, uh, the original painting is probably about 60 uh, or 70 centimetres by 45 centimetres. So it just shows him sitting but um, I don't have the facilities really to sort of be able to sort of zoom out. So I'm just going to show the head, but that's the most important bit. That's really what I'm concentrating on in this video. And uh, I love painting ears straight into the ear. Uh, just trying to be a bit bolder. That's something I learnt with my when I was working on the Bougereau, uh copy after Bougereau that I did. Uh, just um, that you know the colours can be quite rich when they go on uh, initially. Obviously, in the first glaze, you could just sort of spend some time. There. You know, you'll lift some of the paint off. You're going to add other colours and blend them. But I've just started with a little bit of cadmium red and some alizarin crimson and then sap green just to cool it down. Sap green is my go-to for just a, a way of cooling down these very, very warm colours that I use. Uh, in the end of this first glaze, I felt that it was probably a little bit too warm and I could have done more to just try and tone it down. But as I said, I just want to try and be quite bold when I add these colours. As a sort of way of t saving time. But also there's just something quite beautiful about just being able to get it. If you can just get it right first time, then uh, in theory you don't need to go back to it. I know uh, the, the glazing technique lends itself to many glazes and of course they can be very very beautiful but I just I don't know I get a kick out of learning uh, trying to do it quite efficiently if I can as efficiently as possible. One of the reasons I went back to using uh, raw umber and titanium white or raw umber specifically is it is warm, and but I've been struggling with doing uh, working on some backgrounds of paintings recently, and I just think it's quite you can see it in a lot of traditional realist art or Renaissance painting, for example, Rubens or Caravaggio, Velasquez, Rembrandt. Their backgrounds. Uh, sort of based around lots of sort of earth tones so things like raw umber burnt sienna burnt umber and uh, ochres and things like that so i just think it's a uh, really it's a catch-all for me so i don't get too bogged down worrying about you know is it too warm is it too cool and adding lots of different colors and things can get quite messy so just with um using umber alone to start with at least I just felt like a sort of good ground that I could work from without changing too much. Sometimes things can just get overworked, I've found, 
and I just I'd give anything to keep things simple as simple as possible that's the whole idea with being bolder with the color and perhaps bolder with uh, more painterly brush strokes just trying to seek uh, simplicity in uh, this method Just of late, I've taken to using sable brushes. It's got a nice quality. I do like hog's hair brush brushes, and I, you know, I chop and change. But at the moment, uh, sable seems to just be a nice way of applying the paint if I'm doing a glaze. So all of these mixes are based around a little bit of cadmium red, alizarin crimson, sap green and a tiny bit of yellow. Uh, it was definitely a challenge trying to find the right tones and looking at it at the end, it was definitely um, something, you know, it's always going to be the first glaze, so you're just sort of doing it quite tentatively. And there's a lot of guesswork and I can correct anything that hasn't sort of worked properly or hasn't worked as well as it might in the second glaze, third glaze and on. And the nice thing about the sable brush is it just has a very light touch and you can just softly apply a little bit of paint here and there allowing always allowing the underpainting to show through i never really understood uh, how uh, you know people could paint you know the underpainting and then sort of paint over the underpainting as if it's a sort of different painting almost and you can see the value tones are all there but I just found that really, really difficult to sort of have to redo it. So I'm always um, trying to sort of guard against losing the initial drawing and the underpainting. It's just absolutely crucial to hold on to that. In a way, it's a sort of finished painting. People have said to me many times, and I found myself, that the underpainting is something that I could just sign off and, and leave because it's just got such, it's got a nice quality in itself. Uh, but so it's if you if I'm going to add color, it's just being able to find a way to highlight that on the painting. So it's just it's always there as this foundation uh, to the to the finished painting. Another thing I changed slightly when I was working uh, with the initial grisaille was uh, just to use a little bit more thinner with my medium. So, I mean, I use uh, Zestit uh, because it's not a mineral spirit, but you know, it could be just white spirit, I suppose, or, or any kind of uh, mineral spirit. But uh, just, to th just to give it a, a slightly more liquid feel, and yeah, I was quite pleased with that. It, it, felt, it felt a little bit different. And uh, because it had this, uh, umber ground so the whole board was just painted first in a sort of grey you could just see it to the very very left uh, margins of the of the board uh, there's you, you know it's just there I've left it in parts and so it's it's equivalent to the sort of uh, the brushwork that I added over the top and you know because I'm working on that then this very the liquid uh, it's a glazed grisaille essentially so it's not only am I glazing the colour on top of the grisaille but I'm glazing the grisaille over this ground so I did I used a grid for this painting so after I prepared the boards I primed it and then um, just uh, mixed up a, an umber and, and uh, titanium white together and just painted it just to get the sort of right what they call you know like the half tone the mid tone between you know, I suppose it would be the say the equivalent colour of uh, just his cheek, the transition between on uh, his right cheek, just into the sort of very dark shadow area and the highlight. Just it's just that colour, and uh, and the, yeah, so it just had a very nice quality. So as you can see here, it's something that I can use 
when I've got that mid tone, I can work in the, work the highlights into it or build shadows around it. And this highlight it does have some color in it. it doesn't look. Let's just. Uh, more colour goes in as uh, as I've become a little bit bolder, as you know, I've um, answered a few of the questions that I posed, just adding various colours. You just, I'm just, it's all guessing. And I'm continuing the drawing as I go. Something that I do a lot as I paint uh, in this painting is uh, just sort of if I, I mix up a little bit of colour but then I'm wiping it off the brush so the brush isn't overly laden with it so it just becomes a bit more subtle when you apply it. A bit like there for example it's just suddenly too much and so I've just got to get off with my finger. It's just a question of how you add colour to something like this without ruining it. That's uh, been the biggest challenge with this painting. I was just really happy with it and I could have just left it. 
place. So it's just like finding a way to do, to add the colour in the simplest possible way so that it just, it doesn't interfere and it just sort of hovers there. It's almost like an aside. I don't know what I'm trying to say really, but for me, I just, I, I love, I'm a sculptor by training and so it's just all about the drawing and I love working in a monochrome. I love finishing paintings to a high chroma, to a high degree of uh, saturation and colour. But I love the way working with a grisaille means that you can f you sort of fuse the drawing aspect of making a piece of art, making a painting and the and the paint you know they come together in one and so I just love that and it can be enough there and there are many examples of paintings I have to show some I have to look find some and post them on my blog just of artists who've been happy to leave certain works as uh, um, just underpainting uh, not because they were un unfinished or anything like that just because in and of themselves they had a great sort of beauty I just caught myself here putting on too much of the highlight just so I'm just trying to lighten the shadow area so I've just had to wipe some of the paint off the brush and this is something I'm still coming to terms with how you know you've got a very very sort of dark area of shadow but it does have a nuance there are sort of light it's something I just obviously didn't get right in the grisaille uh, relative to now I've darkened the hair above it then suddenly it's um it's lighter, but it's not light enough. I'd like to be able to glaze without using any white at all. So just get the grizz eyes just right. Um, and then surely in theory, it would just be a case of adding color and just a few glazes of color and it would be finished. But anyway, I haven't got there yet. But I just uh, it's to be it's to be consistent in the, all the processes from the very beginning to the end of the painting. So working with a grisaille in this sort of loose painterly fashion, uh, with more medium, more uh, thinner in the medium. So it, it has uh, sort of a wetter quality, but continuing with the. Uh, colour glazes in the same way and uh, just so that the whole painting is consistent. I suppose I mean, I'm just talking about the one painting, just this painting. This is how I've uh, begun this painting so I, I want to be consistent with this uh, approach throughout but it might not be the same for other paintings. For me, I suppose it depends uh, what artists I'm looking at at a, at a given time. And if I'm looking at, for example, recently I've been looking at Rubens and, uh, you know, really loving his uh, very painterly approach. And so that inspired me to try this way. But then I might look at some portraits by Lotto and then just, you know, just be entranced by that just wonderful silken uh, quality to his modelling and uh, just the, the, the beautiful, the grace that uh, his portraits have. And so, you know, then I'll be inspired to just try and do something much more controlled and spend more time, much more time modeling.
So if anyone's trying to do a similar kind of approach or just with any kind of painting, I just couldn't stress uh, strongly enough uh, just how important it is just to sort of relax and just continue working. It's, you've really got to suspend the, all of the doubt that uh, it comes in when, you know, it, it doesn't look right to begin with. And it won't look right really for me generally when I'm working into this. It's usually about the second glaze. Things start to sort of fall into place and it's all about guesswork. And so it's just continuing to just ask little questions. And then it's like this just enormous puzzle. And I'll tentatively start putting colours down and then I'll see 10 minutes later that they're not quite right or I can add a little bit more. Uh, take away some and I'm just always adjusting the drawing but it's just to sort of take a breath and continue but just uh, paramount to this technique and why I love it so much is that just hold on to the drawing you've just got to keep um, the drawing visible and as long as that's still there then you've just got nothing to worry about. It doesn't matter even if he, his face is bright green, you can still sort of go over it again. That's okay. That could be changed. You can just go over it with a red glaze and completely neutralise that. That's why this is a method that could work for beginners of painting for anyone. It's just to take care in the initial drawing uh, in some of my other videos, I've uh, just uh, shown, you know, how I might approach, you know, drawing and just purely as a time saving device, I would use a grid. Of course, it's always best to work from life if possible. It just takes much longer. It takes for me, it takes about twice as long, maybe three times as long because I've got to just be absolutely sure I've got the drawing right. But then with a the grid, you know, you've just got um, those points of reference and you can uh, just speed things up so much and you've got like a guarantee as long as you're disciplined about it. But you know, when that drawing's finished and then the grisaille is, you know, if you take care with the grisaille, then uh, the paint is sort of finished at that moment. Certainly on one level anyway, in terms of the drawing. And the drawing is the foundation of it. If you want to catch it, capture a likeness, you can have all the colours uh, all perfectly done. But, you know, if it's all over the place and the proportions are out, then um, it's pointless. So it's just suspending all of the disbelief, all of that doubt, and just slowly, slowly guessing just one step at a time. And I'm, sure, I'm just convinced that anyone could do it. I think what I've seen is just uh, when you know when people do do it, everyone rushes a little bit, and so I don't want uh, these videos to be at all misleading. It's just uh, the crucial point is to just take to take our time when we're doing it, and you know it's enough rather than you know I'm trying to sort of achieve it in like maybe three or four glazes, but you know, it's fine to do you know like generally people would do ten, twenty glazes. And that, that's a very sort of normal practice. Uh, Titian said you should do 60 glazes, but I'm sure he was just trying to shock people when he said that. Uh, I, I don't know if I've necessarily seen evidence of that in his work. I'm sure it would just look overworked. But you can see in his later works how fluid and loose and painterly his brushwork is. And, you know, there will be you know, low, so many glazes and he's just, he's building it up literally as Monet would paint his water lilies just sort of over and over again in this really rich tapestry of colour. Uh, sorry, I'm waffling a lot, but my point is that uh, he's just built it up slowly in lots of layers uh, and um, they're just taking his time. Well, maybe he hasn't taken his time actually, but a beginner can. And when I'm doing it, I'm just doing it really, really carefully. And we don't have to rush until we're completely confident we know what we're doing. It takes, you know, these are 
you know, artists, it's take, they've had long apprenticeships and uh, many years of working sort of arrive at these kinds of these styles and ways of working. If I'm talking about Titian specifically, uh, you know, he's one of the greatest artists of all time. So, you know, we don't need to rush or it's, it's impossible to sort of get close to it, but we can sort of begin to approach that way of working but just taking it a step at a time and just not not succumbing to the doubt or the pessimism that can arise because things don't appear to be working or showing results as quickly as we might like. I'm not sure how much of this film, how much of the colour this film's really showing. It still looks like a grisaille, to be honest. But I suppose that was something that I was after, uh, trying to hold on to that and uh, let it have that quite earthy quality. But I promise there is colour. I am applying colour, just very, very slowly. Again, just, I don't want to rush it. And I just want to take my time. Because all colours relative anyway, you know, if I was to, and I do later in this glaze, I don't think I show it in the video, but I add a slightly sort of cooler, slightly bluer tone uh, because the, the reference I have uh, just in the background is just slightly blue around his head. Uh, so it was certainly just cooler. So I just add a little bit of that and, you know, the colour then bounces off that and it suddenly sort of jumps out and becomes a little bit warmer again. I don't want it to be... This is what I said earlier about the backgrounds. I you know, I don't I don't want that to be too pronounced, and uh, I'm so I'm trying to hold on to the grisaille. So it's just just even a slight glaze over that, just to make it a little bit cooler.
my brush always has paint on it. Uh, it's just I'm wiping it off. I mix it on the palette, mix the colour up, and then just take a rag and just wipe uh, quite firmly, wipe all of the paint off so there's just enough to create just a very sort of fine film of paint, very fine glaze. So I like this bit, just adding some highlights to the hair. Uh, it transforms it in a minute. Um, I finished the grisaille in one go. Normally I, I would do, you know, have a couple of passes over a grisaille underpainting. Uh, so effectively, I mean, this does have a little bit of colour in it. It's got, it's hard to see perhaps, but it's got, it does have a little bit of yellow, little red possibly, uh, but definitely some umber and white. But it's as if I'm just continuing a second pass on the grisaille. Really the colours are just pretty much the same at this stage as the skin tones. So I could just add a little bit here and there if I'm just I'm always just looking and I guess my eyes going all over the place what needs to be done and it can appear quite random but I'm just looking at the reference and just seeing you know uh, where I might be able to sort of place some paint, the paint that's on my brush. I'll see how the painting goes uh, in the, into the second and third glazes, but I'd really like to be able to sort of preserve this sort of quite loose handling, uh, certainly for the hair, just in these highlights. I just felt that was, that was quite satisfying to do and worked pretty well.
Oh, that's a bit too bright. Better take it off. Just gonna add a little bit more umber just to make just to darken it. And the the, the tone of the value of the background is right. It's just uh, trying to just uh, sharpen up that line around and redraw the line of his hair just behind his ear and his neck. Uh, so I'm going to stop waffling on now, uh, but uh, there's another uh, seven minutes or so to go of this video. I cropped it ever so slightly and uh, the this glaze probably took about an hour, but I, uh, I haven't shown it. But I spent the last sort of 15 minutes of, uh, of the hour just doing the uh, painting his top. So painting, uh, and you can't even see it anyway, so I've just left that out. So I just wanted to concentrate on the glazing over uh, this portrait's head and I hope you've enjoyed it. Very soon I'm going to post uh, some videos, a uh, short series copying a uh, Car Caravaggio because I'd very much like to just see if I can learn something from his technique. I'll just let this video play out now for the last bit and uh, talk to you soon.